Hey, I think I got it. Good evening, everybody. We are back with some more talking, more stuff, more creators, more stories. Um, this tonight is a uh, suggested video. Um, I had somebody request uh, about raccoons for us to be talking about tonight, so I figured we'll make that. We'll make that our Friday nights. Is um, every Friday night will be a requested subject. And Tuesday nights will be something that I wanted to cover in terms of a specific subject that might be relevant to any kind of news or something that comes up, like a new article that I found. So I figured, let's try this and see how things go. Um, pipeline, I will be getting a new microphone eventually. Uh, right now I'm just using a very simple Logitech camera microphone system. So bear with the Stone Age tech and we'll see what we can figure out. So, jumping right into it, raccoons. Um, you see them everywhere. They are everywhere. Um, they are native to North America, so you'll find them in uh, down as far as Mexico, naturally, uh, North America, uh, Canada, all the way up to just about Canada, or not Canada, Alaska. That's where I end up seeing most of them at the, about the limit of where they're going to be. If it's a habitable, 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 I can't talk. <laughs> if the climate is suitable for their existence, they will be there. So, And uh, a couple of things that have been happening is they are popping up on other parts of the world because people are importing them as pets or hunting purposes or for whatever reason. And we'll get more into that a little later tonight. Um, haberdashable. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Uh, so raccoons are a carnivore species, but they are also, they are technically omnivorous. So they'll eat quite literally everything. I mean, we all see them getting into garbage. We see them getting into bird feeders. We see them eating other animals. This is the best existence of nature that they can be able to digest and process just about everything. Um, they can be affected by junk food that um, we leave out with our garbage. They can become obese. They can have liver and heart issues because of just the nonsense that we allow them to eat. Um, with raccoons, they are uh, they don't mate for life. They are not a lot of animals really do. That's a that's a weird concept for mating for life with the natural kingdom. That's more common with birds than for mammalian species, is what I have been finding. At least in terms of what I've been exposed to. With the raccoons. They have a litter, and actually we're just about to hit uh, birthing season here really quick here in western Washington. A uh, bunch of guys I know and the rest of the United States, East Coast and Midwest, are already starting to find raccoon litters. And a litter can be anywhere from 2 to 5. Average is 3 to 5 usually in terms of what um, will be born. It's very rare to find more than that on very rare occasions. Has, have I found there to be more than five? And that's because it's usually a sister set of females gave birth at the same time. Now that is incredibly rare. I don't want people to think that's a pretty common system. With raccoons, um, they are probably the most adept animal at learning how to cohabitate with humans. They are, they are imprintable in the fact of, yes, you can have one as a pup and attempt to bring it up as a pet. The problem is it only knows you as a reliable food source and a very easy life. It is still a wild animal. They do not make good pets. They're not domesticated. And I've covered this on different talks. We'll, we'll make a whole subject of just domestication on another night. Um, this was an image I found. Um, it just thought it'd be an interesting starting point. This is a, a platform bird feeder with a raccoon hanging out in it. Yes, they'll go for bird feeders regularly. They will find ways to hang by their back feet and twist off the lid of other bird feeders or knock it straight to the ground. So long as they can get to the food, they'll figure it out. Um, they are also very adept climbers. I have found these guys to be able to climb up the corner caps of the side of a house. A corner cap is basically where you get the outer corner of a house. So it's basically, uh, let's see if we can get into the camera here. So it's basically where they get to this outside corner, there's a piece of wood that sits on the outside of that corner and they can get their claws around it and pull themselves up the side of the house with that. 
and they will also climb downspouts, just like a reverse fireman pole. They'll shimmy straight up it. So these guys are very good at getting places they shouldn't be but want to be. As I've always said, if a raccoon wants to get somewhere, they will figure out a way, and that's just how it goes. Um, they are very commonly found in, um, in homes regularly. I've been getting a lot of calls for raccoons breaking into homes and trashing places. It happens, nature of the beast. The problem is because there's so many raccoons. Um, there was a study done by University of Nebraska. I want, I'll have to double check my timestamp. I forgot to look that up. Um, I want to say it was 2012, 2014, where they did a population evaluation of um, wild versus urbanized, like within the city centers. Um, and they found that with the raccoon population, one square mile, just one square mile of just land, no people, no campgrounds, nothing, no humans, can sustain anywhere from one to three raccoons per square mile. Now moving into the cities, Chicago, Toronto, New York, um, we'll just say Coal City, uh, just little, any kind of city area, there can be anywhere from 30 to 120 raccoons per square mile. Now this is going to vary dramatically depending on the population uh, density as well as how much food is available for the animals. A rule of nature is excess food causes excess population. So when you get more food available, there's going to be more animals. Same thing goes with uh, shelter and water. Those are the three basics of life. is food, water, shelter. If you get all three, you have the sustainability of life. So with raccoons, they know where to look for it everywhere. Uh, they get food because garbage that's been covered. People grow fruit, fruit bushes, fruit trees, um, bird feeders. The other is uh, shelter. We give them a lot of that. We have homes, we have sheds, we have decks, we have abandoned cars, garages. We have literally homes that they can tear open and get into. Uh, I have had a raccoon tear its way right into a roof. Actually, do I have my pictures? Let's get some pictures up here. Animal pictures. All the pictures. Where did it go? Let's see, let's see. Get the animal pictures, but I don't know. Here we go, animal damage. Okay, so let's start. Let's start with a roof. This is one of my favorites. Oops, no, I don't want to do that. Okay. Let's change the image here. And let's do... This one. This is a... Um, there it is. This is a... Uh, one story house it was a rambler that uh, a raccoon literally tore six holes in this roof. Um, you can see a couple of them here in this picture, but it's basically the she couldn't figure out the spot she wanted. It turns out the roof was rotting out from underneath. This roof is in absolutely terrible condition, but it's still a lived in structure. So, what ended up happening, she punched out. Um, and you can see there's uh, the big one there directly below that dome light, the one next to it, and then there's another one underneath the paper here, and then there's four more on either side. So they just couldn't figure out where they wanted to be. Now this roof was surprisingly easy for them to get into. No surprise, it was rotting. So it had its own, it's what I call conducive conditions. It's something that allows the animal easier access to where they want to go. Now. If we go to another one, this is this is under a house. This is what we call a crawl space vent. Um, the vent had heavy plastic and screen behind it. Why are you buzzing? Stop buzzing, for goodness sake. Okay. Um, and she basically just tore it right out. Uh, this was a stand-up tall crawl space that I was able to get into, and I ended up chasing her out completely. Um, I took the pups out, 
put them in a box, set them outside the hole, closed off the vent, so I was able to get her out completely uh, and get the pups out and close up the vent. But this is the damage that these guys can do. Do, do, do. What, what, what? All these messages. Good grief. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta turn off all my notifications for different things on <laughs> stream times. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Female raccoon had pups. Um, when raccoons have pups, uh, they are blind for about the first four weeks of their life. They can't see, they can't hear, they can't, they literally cannot survive without her. Um, and let's see here. I can put up another picture. We're going to do animal pictures. Now, if you want to see how small a very, very new raccoon pup is, that is my hand holding a less than a week old raccoon. Um, female abandoned them. I pulled them out, got them to a rehabilitator. Uh, but this just gives you an idea of how small, I mean, that is my hand. That's, that's this hand right here is the one that I am holding him in. It was one of three that I pulled out from underneath the house. She left, never came back. I ended up taking them to a rehabilitator in order for them to do what they can. So with raccoons, you can see the eyes are still closed. I need to figure out a way so I can, you can see my cursor on the screen here. The eyes are closed. The ears are technically still closed. They can't hear, so they are blind and deaf. But the way they sound, you will never forget it. I can actually, I actually use this on different jobs in order to try to get them to call out, in order for me to find them um, if they are up in an attic or crawl space where I can't physically see the animal. I will play this to try to get them to see if I can get it. That's just a general call when she is on the nest with the pups. That's what, and you hear that sound everywhere in movies, it, along with anytime there's a, a clip of a raccoon. Um, <laughs> oh, you think you okay? Try this one. That's what it sounds like when they're in distress. Stop. Okay, make it stop. Go away. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> hey! We have Andy. He is here and ready to go. Glad you can make it, man. So, um, but yeah, that is a distressed raccoon pup. They will, it literally is so loud, it makes your ears ring. If you don't have, like, it's almost to the point where, um, subject is still here wrestling mammals. <laughs> I mean, yes, I've tussled with plenty of critters up in insulation when I've had to. I prefer not to anymore. <laughs> um, so with the pups, a lot of people confuse them for thinking they have uh, birds up inside their attic or their crawl spaces because they keep hearing that chatter of the pups and nobody knows what a raccoon pup sounds like ever and that's okay they go based on the fact that they hear it during the daytime which they can if the pups get too hot or too cold they'll call out saying they need to be warm or they need to be fed and things like that because she'll be leaving every single night in order to maintain herself as well as the pups so they need to feed literally daily if not multiple times in a day so she needs to keep herself nutritionally sustained in order to get the pups taken care of. Now, um, <laughs> the problem with raccoon pups is once their eyes and ears open, they hit the point of what we call mobile, where they are able to actually start moving around all on their own. And that just makes for an adventure all in itself. I had a house. Here we go. We're jumping straight into some stories. I'll get to more of the facts in a little bit here. I got a couple cool trivia things you guys will want to hear. I had a house that was, let's see, this would be back in Illinois when I started doing this, way, way back in yesteryear. I had a house 
that they had what's called an enclosed soffit. And soffit is what you would call the eaves or the part that sticks out over the side of the house. An enclosed soffit is basically a closed-in box. Give me a second. I got to take a drink here. Hey, make sure you got water. I will be harping on people to make sure you're drinking water. Thank you. Water. Um, it ended up the pups had become old enough that they became mobile. And I basically cut 15 holes in the underside of these eaves trying to chase them out of this attic. The homeowner didn't care. They wanted them out. They wanted them gone. So I did everything I could to chase them and try to get them out of the house. I ended up tag teaming it with another technician that was there with me. And we ended up getting four jogging pups as we called them because they could fit through a hole that was that big whereas my arm can't even fit through that so i ended up having to struggle with chasing them around um, i did also have a house where they were in what's called a void space a space where you literally just can't physically get to it without cutting open either the 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 living room uh, the the actual ceiling of the room or cutting a hole in the roof in order to get them out so I had already pulled a couple of the pups out and couldn't get the last one. He was just mobile enough. He, screw, he squiggled away out of my grip. So I put a big canvas bag. I stapled that directly to the opening of the ceiling. I put two of the pups inside this bag. It was deep enough that they couldn't actually climb out. And my idea was basically he's going to crawl over the ceiling and then fall into the bag with the others. Overnight, it worked. Nobody slept, but... <laughs> It did solve the problem. That's all that really matters. Um, moving on to some of the trivia about these guys. Um, so these guys have actually been a huge problem in Japan. Raccoons. Actually, let's see if we can find some of the damage. Raccoon damage in Japan. Basically, what they've been doing is these centuries-old temples. Temple. There we go. These century-old temples are getting ripped apart by these animals because these places aren't designed to be even to interact with these animals. They were brought over as a. I can't find a good picture um, in terms of some of the temple damage. There's a really cool documentary you can check out through PBS called Raccoon Nation. I highly suggest everybody watches it at some point. Just because it paints a really cool picture of, um, here we go. Let's try this one. This gives you an idea of what they were doing. Because they have, no, no. No, it's a copywritten picture. I'm not going to worry about that one. You can, you, you can Google half the pictures out there anyway. Um, you found a dead raccoon in an attic last week. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How far gone was it? Was there was there still fur? Was it naked? I'm curious now uh, because you will find raccoons will become infected with different diseases. Um, one of them in particular is distemper and rabies. Those are the two most common ones that you'll find that are um, transmittable to either humans or pets. Um, a disease that is transmittable to a human is called a zoonotic. Uh, we we're, all, we're dealing with a nationwide zoonotic as it is, but we're not going to discuss that. Um, oh, if he was skinless, he's he he been there for a while. He been there for a while, and uh, well, <laughs> those are the fun ones. I had I had some coworkers at one of the companies I used to work with. They were so morbid about it that they would take. The husks is what I always called them. They would take and save the husks and mount them in shadow boxes in their office as a display. And I, it, oh my gosh, it blew my mind on what they would do. Um, touching back to Japan, so there was a TV show, uh, an animated show, I believe, called Rascal, that happened. That was many years ago, and Rascal actually. When did that read? Rascal the Raccoon. When did that air? This aired... Okay. Do, do, do. 
based on the 1963 autobiographical novel, Rascal, a memoir of a better era. Let's see, the show... 1977. Wow, okay. I didn't realize it was that old. So 1977 is when the um, when Rascal ended up happening. So I can show... Let's do this. I'll give you guys a quick picture here of what the uh, the what the show image was. Oh, where'd it go? This. This is what the show was based like. This was the the show for Rascal, 1977, right there. So what ended up happening is with this story. It was about a kid that had a pet raccoon. And the problem with Rascal is he kept getting into trouble and causing mischief in the town. It got to a point where the town didn't want him in the village anymore. And he had to be released and set free into the bamboo forest. And that's how the problem began with the raccoons. It suddenly becoming a problem in Japan. People wanted these animals so badly they were caught and shipped to Japan to be pets or novelty pets. Like you've seen it, people have the mountain lions, the tigers, the bears, all these other things as pets. I wanna make sure that, I wanna distinctly say that this is not, nothing to do with animal rescues or those that are used in acting and films. Um, this is specifically as a hobby pet or a vanity pet. With these raccoons, what ended up happening, people learned very quickly that they are not good pets. Um, they're more energetic than a ferret they smell worse and they have bigger teeth. So think something, the brain of an overactive ferret in the strength of a dog with the destructive nature of a toddler, but it has claws. So uh, there's a lot to unpack with that. So basically what ended up happening, they saw from this TV show, Rascal, that they would just let the animal go and that would be the end of it and he would live happily ever after. Well, the problem is, They've already started affecting the ecosystem that's there because that's what happens when you release an animal that doesn't belong in that ecosystem. Raccoons being the prolific uh, eaters that they are, and they can live off of practically everything, they will destroy whatever they need to to get in and eat whatever they want. So they're already affecting the native bird species, some of the native, um, they'll eat insects. So they be eating, uh, crawdads are a big thing that they like, a lot of crayfish, crabs, mollusks, they'll get into the bankside stuff. So actually, that's a little, that's a fun little detour. So everybody always says that raccoons, um, I just realized I'm talking really fast. If I'm becoming too hard to understand, let me know and I'll force myself to start slowing down. Yes, that is exactly why Florida is having a huge issue with the pythons, the Burmese pythons, uh, because the climate there is so perfect for them to thrive that they're killing the native ecosystem. Um, and that's why they now have these bounty programs in order to try to catch and remove as many pythons and eggs as possible. But we can that'll be a talk for another day. I'll, my list grows forever. So what ends up happening with these raccoons is now because they've been displaced out of their traditionally natural habitat, they end up getting into the structures that are there and those are the big old temples like you, you see them in anime you see them in tv shows all the time they're beautiful structures but they get these holes torn into them by the raccoons regularly and that's why now um government the japanese government has them on a kill on site practically because they just they don't belong they can't be there um and they're wrecking havoc on the historical structures as well as the ecosystem itself. And that's that's our fault. That is 100% our fault as humans. Um, and we need to, we have to take the measures now to correct that. It's no longer old nature work itself out. Yes, that's called extinction by other creatures when it's something else moves in. Um, and God, I love going on these tangents because I completely forget what I'm doing otherwise. So, but they, oh, that's right, getting back to Japan. They do still have these raccoon and otter and cat cafes that they do. Uh, and they do say, how widespread are they now? Uh, you can actually find them throughout sections of Europe. 
Uh, they are definitely, Japan definitely, all over North America, um, reaching all the way up to Alaska, down into Mexico. They haven't quite made it all the way down to South America, uh, as far as I'm aware. If I find an article that says otherwise, I will happily be corrected, because that's how science works. You learn until it is incorrect, and then you make a correction. Science! So, with the, with the widespread, they just become an icon now of cute, adorable troublemakers. Yes, and at the same time, we are causing them to be this smart. Uh, Chicago, I'm from there originally, and Chicago is inadvertently teaching raccoons to be incredibly smart. With these, uh, with the raccoons, everybody tries to keep the raccoons out of the garbage cans. They use bungee cords, they use latches, they build wood frames, everything they can. Well, several raccoons are learning to chew up the bungee cords so they break and then they can get in. Or they're learning to push them out to the point that they fall over and then they get into the food that way. Or they just learn to tear open that wood frame until they can get into the can. There's just so many different things we are teaching them to be smarter. Inadvertently, we're teaching them to be smarter. There was a really cool video, an article I saw, I want to say, I don't remember exactly where it was done, but they basically had um, 15 boxes that had different latches on them, and they set it out with food in each of these little compartments. And they talked, they, they uh, timed the raccoons naturally to see how fast they could figure out how to pop the lock or undo the latch, reach in and pull out the food until it was completely empty. And the, the speed that they learned was tremendous. It went from like, like 15-ish minutes to less than 10 for them to open it up and clean it all out. And I have experienced stuff like that because... With, my, with the catching of raccoons that I do, you will get where they will be caught and moved to a different area. Now, there's a whole other science that goes into relocating and translocating an animal. And I'll be getting into the difference of those two words another time. Uh, but with the raccoons, they and this one goes with almost any mammal, they can become what's called educated, or what we call in the, in the industry, trap smart. They have been caught had a traumatic experience, a very stressful experience in that environment and know what the cage looks like and they know they will not go back into it. Drink your water. If you have, keep, keep a water bottle. I'm going to keep reminding people, drink your water. Come on. Um, the, just the education that these animals have figured out is amazing. So that's why I say they have the destructive knowledge I mean, no, I can't tell you what to do, but I can encourage you to be healthy. <laughs> I can't tell anybody what to do, but I can definitely let you know my opinion. And that's okay. Everybody's entitled to their own opinion. Um, so let's see. Where was I going with the rest of this? So, uh, yes, they are a really cool animal. There's so much about them that we're still learning and understanding. Um, with raccoons, they can get up to the biggest raccoon I ever caught, I no, ever had to deal with, was a 45 pound raccoon. Hi, Asia. thanks for tuning in. I appreciate that. I had an assumption, but yes. The one reason I hate dealing with rats because they are skittish and learn. If I'm not on my toes, it's going to be a problem. Yes. <laughs> we can have a rat talk um, another time. But yeah, um, we're getting all these great ideas, guys. If you think of something that you want me to discuss, send me a message through Twitch. That's how I'm able to separate the information because with this, with the chat bar that I'm looking at, I'm not going to be able to remember all of that. I'm telling you that right now. So you can always go through and message me on Twitch. Um, there's a whisper function or something like that. I'll figure it out one of these days. This is only, what, my fourth stream, so I know exactly what I'm doing. <laughs> It took me, hey, it took me forever to figure out how to put the chat box in the stream. So, I'll figure it out one of these days. Um, but yes, we'll definitely talk rats one of the days. And kind of the, the history and the different information about them. The widespread, the species, all that. We'll, we'll have fun. Um, so, let's see. Now, raccoons also can become, uh, they don't necessarily hibernate. They have a thing that they can do called going into torpor. Uh, 
I want to get this right. Versus hibernation versus torpor. Okay. I want to get this right. Torpor involves physiological changes related to related especially to body temperature, metabolism, and water balance. Hibernation is when the organism spends the winter in a state of dormancy. It is long-term multi-day torpor for survival of conditions. So raccoons do not hibernate. They can enter torpor is the difference. So that's kind of where the separation is um, because they will still be active throughout the winter time. I did have one that I was trying to get out of a house and it went into a torpid state where I basically had a cage mounted over a hole on a house for three months. He wasn't dead. We could see him because it was a very old home that had lath and plaster ceilings. Lath and plaster, if you're not sure, they're little lath is little strips of wood that are tacked up to the side of the wall and then plaster is smeared on top of it. That's how the old homes were built with the with the walls and the ceilings. So there was some of the, the plaster had given way and you could see him or some of the fur through the lath. I would take just a piece of wire and just poke him and he would growl and look down at me, but he wouldn't leave. He would not leave. That cage was up there for three consecutive months until I get a call and that raccoon was in that cage. And I got him out, got the hull sealed up and we were finally done. But that was the longest single raccoon project I ever had and it was it was dumb it was oh my gosh it was the dumbest the dumbest raccoon job I've ever had to deal with it wasn't even a huge project it was one corner of a house it was getting into and it just didn't want to leave that's about all there is to it so um keeping on the subject of a couple different stories with raccoons I get a call I got another job back in Illinois I get a call 2 a.m. They have raccoons in their kitchen. The fun thing about this night, it is the night of 4th of July. So there are fireworks going off everywhere. So absolutely, that can affect animals and their behavior. I get the call. The lady is bare. I felt so bad for this woman. I, re I really did. I felt so bad for her. She was barricaded in her bathroom, curled up in her bathtub, terrified because bunch of raccoons had come into her house and they were downstairs in her kitchen so i'm like okay i'm gonna come over here's my fee i can come out and take care of this here we go and they prove the fee i go out there i come up to the house i'm like hey your front door's locked how am i supposed to get in so well how do the raccoons get in i'm like i don't know but i'm not getting in the way they did so the husband came down unlocked the door and he ran right back upstairs to the bathroom so I go in there, and I have my flashlight. I leave the, the, the thing is, if you ever get into a situation, you don't want to scare the animal as, you want to scare it as little as possible if it's in a contained area where things can go bad very quickly. So I leave the lights off, and I have my flashlight, so I'm just looking around inside the house, and I hear plink, plank, plunk on a piano. I'm like, what is going on? So I show my flashlight to the piano, and a young raccoon, a juvenile, raccoon sticks his head out of a baby grand piano he was walking on the wires on the strings of the piano and then i hear a pot fall off a, a fall off of a counter i swing over to the kitchen which is same it's a big grand area so the raccoons are in this big first floor level of this house the the, the couple was upstairs in the up in the upstairs bathroom i'm looking around and there are five raccoons had gotten into this house the one in the piano one was in the vent fan the the over the stove that's where they had come in from one hadn't come down all the way he had his head stuck out from underneath that hood one was in the fireplace or not the fireplace the stove because they had a gas burner stove um one was inside the housing and he had stuck his head out from one of the burners there was another on a bar stool that was spinning because it was the one that knocked the pot off he was sitting on that and two had their hands like caught hands caught in the cookie jar quite literally in a i want to say it was oh what was that jar it, it was a food substance yeah yeah pretty much it was it, it felt like something out of gremlins it quite literally did 
So I, well, I ended up chasing them around the house, got them all gathered and caught, put them all in one cage, checked around, looked for nothing else, put them outside, chewed them on their way, went around, found where they climbed in through the fence, closed that off, went into the house, told them they're fine, they're going to need to clean everything because there was urine everywhere from these animals having played around and everything, getting it, especially being a kitchen. It was, it, being a kitchen made it the worst. So, hi, Caller. I see you there. Thanks for joining in. Um, yeah, guys, I really appreciate all of you tuning in and listening to me about these different things. It means a lot to me because I really want to see this um, kind of be its own niche market to really grow and be something kind of cool. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to keep going on this. So thank you guys for tuning in. I just want to say that. Um, basically, they ended up having to come in and wipe down the whole kitchen, the countertops, uh, the tables, everything. They, the piano was fine, apparently. It was just playing around on the strings in the back. So that house, totally fine on that one. Um, let's see, what's another one? Ah, I had a raccoon get into a bedroom because it fell through a skylight. Yes, a skylight. This house had apparently what are, uh, they're the kind of skylights that you, you hook a pole up to the, to the mechanism. Ding, 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 ding. You can, you can raise the, uh, the glass, but there's still a screen in the way. And being in the middle of summer, they had it open um, just for a nice night. Had the, the air was out and everything. The raccoon stepped onto the screen. And when it put its full weight on that screen, the screen gave way, and he fell straight into the bedroom. <laughs> Needless to say, both parties were incredibly surprised at what happened. <laughs> the homeowner, it was just one of them were home, and they were just getting ready for the night, but the raccoon literally fell right onto the bed. And they stared at each other for about a good 10 seconds before they both panicked and ran separate directions. So... I had to practically dismantle the bed to try to, to hook the guy out of there. But it was... Uh, that was a fun one. So let's see. We've covered diet. We've covered habitation. Some extra trivia. Oh, the family. So raccoons are in their own family. In terms of... Now this is talking um, kingdoms. you got kingdom, phylum, class, order, super family, family. They are in the carnivore order. The how am I going to pronounce this one? How do I pronounce this one? The Mustelo Mustelodia. They are a superfamily of the Mustelodia. Uh, so weasels. Um, is, uh, the Mustelodia is um, skunk, ramp, red panda, weasels. Raccoons, or they're classifying as raccoons and allies. Their sub is the uh, Procyonidae, because uh, the raccoon's Latin name is Procyon Lotor. So they're part of the Procyonidae um, so, uh, superfamily for that. The whole animal kingdom being revamped has been really interesting to be following on, because that changes regularly now with DNA testing. My first ever attic inspection ever with my company. I pop my head into the scutter hole. I hear chittering and hot breath on my neck. I turn around and my raccoon is in front of her babies. For years, I'm not going to an attic unless it walk up or pull down. Oh my gosh, I have been there. I have been there. I have been there. Yes, I wholeheartedly agree that that can be terrifying. Um, one thing I'll do just for my own bit of safety is I go along with a little... Um, a little gas-powered uh, airsoft pistol. Uh, airsoft, if you're not familiar familiar with them, they shoot little plastic BBs. They're not super super damaging on what they do. They're made for people to shoot people, so they're mildly safe. I will use it to discourage a raccoon from coming up at me. So I have one in my back pocket whenever I'm going up there, and I have had to use it a couple times. I had one. Um, it was with a pest control company I used to work with. I ran their wildlife department. Um, and I get a call from one of the rodent inspectors saying, hey man, 
I just went out because they thought they had rats. Turns out it's raccoons. Come here and come deal with this. I go crawling up there, and raccoon with pups. No surprise. And so I go up there. Oh, raccoon with pups. I go back to my truck. I get my little airsoft pistol. I go back up there, and I see the pups are right in front of what is called the chimney box. The chimney box is a structure inside the attic where they put your fireplace. Uh, it's usually if you have a gas or a wood power or a wood burning stove or wood pyre, wood burning fireplace, but it's not a brick chimney. That's the the firebox or the the chimney box that I have to deal with, where the raccoons will nest inside of that or put their pups right next to it. So she's inside of there, sticking her face out between a couple slats, and the pups are literally right in front of her. So my thought was, okay, um, get her away, get the pups out, put them in a in a nesting box. So she can take them out somewhere else. The problem is she wasn't letting me get close. So I line up my pistol. Pop! I stung her right on the nose. I hear this bark and she goes running right out of the attic. Now like I say, my goal was not to actually hurt her but to discourage her. And I hit her right on the button. So she left. She flat out left that attic. Well, like me, a rodent inspector, and my manager... My manager was there with me because he was riding along to see how the wildlife jobs were going. So I, he, they all got the extra special treatment when, I went along, when they went along with me on this one. Um, but yeah, that was that's one of the few times you have a little. You just got to figure out the little safety tricks. Um, speaking of tricks, okay, here we go. New subject. There's a way to get female raccoons to remove pups all on their own. So actually, we'll get. We have a picture we can do along with this. Okay, here we go. New image, change. New image, new image, new image. Animal pictures. Let's see if I can find it. Here we go. Well, the orientation is wrong. <laughs> I don't know how to fix that. So take the picture and just rotate it a good 90 degrees. So this is me looking inside of a vent hole on the side of a house where there is a raccoon pup inside. So it was one of four that I wasn't able to get to and they didn't want their ceiling cut into for me to remove them. So what I ended up doing is there is a paste and a fluid variant that you can use called Vanish or Raccoon Eviction Fluid. What this does is it is basically male raccoon pheromone and bits ground up into a paste or made it or extracted and made into a liquid. And what this does, you spritz it and squirt it right in the area where the pups are and you smear it right near the opening of where she's coming in and out. Male raccoons will come in, kill the pups in an effort to try to put her back into heat in order to have their own litter. So you can use this to your advantage where you take this stuff, you smear it where they are. She will, within three days, if it doesn't work within three days, it didn't work. She will take the pups, remove them, and take them somewhere else within three days. The first two days will be her panicking, trying to figure out where to go. At the very minimum, if she doesn't find something soon, she'll take them that night if she wants to. So it is incredibly effective stuff, and it reeks. It is disgustingly potent. Um, this is something I always recommend. And this is going to go for a default for all my streams. I'm talking as a trained professional. I don't want anybody trying to do this on their own. If you've never dealt with it before, I'm here to inform. I'm not here to educate you on how to do the job. I'm here to teach you the information about the animals. So I want to be very clear. I don't want anybody trying to do this on their own without supervision, without an education, without having training of some sort. So that being said, I've done my own dumb blunders, and we'll cover that later. <laughs> uh, but with the paste, I did end up getting some on me uh, inadvertently. I got it on the back of my sleeve. I went half the day wondering, God, why do I smell like this stuff? Man, I can't, couldn't figure out where I got it on me because it was behind the sleeve of my shirt. I somehow got some on me. You mess with stuff enough, you, you, absolutely, you absolutely can <laughs> get things on you you didn't mean to. Um, but that's where this comes in with a situation like this, where you can get the female raccoon to take her litter and move on. And you don't have to do anything to hurt them, bother them, whatever. They will do their own thing and vamoose. And that's beautiful. I will take it. I will let them do their job for me. <laughs> Put it that way. Then I can fix the hole, reinforce the house, and not worry about that. 
that's another subject we'll cover on is things to look at on a house to what's vulnerable to animals and I can showcase a whole bunch of the damage that I've had done on different homes so but that's one of the things that can be done uh, the male the raccoon eviction fluid and the other product called vanish does very well with that because it's specifically designed for raccoons now the effectiveness of this drops off after they have been um, after their eyes have opened it literally starts dropping by the week by another like 10 percent so if they are if they've had their eyes open and they are functioning for the past few weeks to a month the effectiveness of it is going to drop dramatically uh, once they are full grown and able to completely climb and follow her out of the den the effectiveness of it drops to basically about 20 percent and that's when you actually have to start doing oh, excuse me um, eviction methods, exclusion, repairing the homes, stuff like that. Drink your water. I drink to help keep up with my throat. I'm not used to talking this much. Well, no, I'm used to talking, but I'm used to having discussions with people where it's not just me talking at everything. So, let's see. We've covered rascal. We've covered basic, basic biology. We've covered a couple bunch of different stories. What else do we have? Mm. People and pets can't will be attacked by these. Um, rabies is actually very popular. They are, raccoons are one of the top four, top four vectors for rabies transmission. Um, and the only way they can test for rabies is they have to open up the brain. Uh, the rhabdovirus resides in the spinal fluid and in the spinal column and in the brain in the brain matter itself. Um, and so when an animal bites a person or another or a pet, you run the risk of fluid transfer, which then is what transmits the rabies virus. So you can't necessarily, you, I say this with a varying degree of probability, you don't usually get it from just a scratch. But if the animal has licked its paws or anything like that and then scratches you or you get a cut from the animal, anything is possible when it comes to being infected from a, by a vector animal. Anything and everything can go. So do not, do not touch, handle, do anything with an animal. If you don't have training, gear, protective knowledge, anything, just don't do it. Call guys like me. That's what we're here for. So... Um, but they will attack pets, uh, especially females with pups. Uh, and I can get into, a, we'll make a whole talk of what to do during um, off-break season. Have I seen the video of the older fella hand feeding about 20 plus raccoons on the back porch? Oh, oh, I have so much anxiety when I see that video. I know the one you're talking about. Yes, he's putting himself in a tremendous amount of risk. Um, one, because you have so many animals coming together in one particular location, that is a huge vector issue of not just for him, but for the other animals themselves. Uh, distemper is very commonly translated through uh, raccoons. It's very contagious for uh, cats. There's a, there's a canine and a feline distemper. Um, I'm going to have to check. I'll have to do a whole section on just diseases. But raccoons can carry raccoons can carry a distemper strain that can translate over the dogs, and so you can cross contaminate. It's it's not a zoonotic to humans like we aren't affected by it, but we can be a carrier. We absolutely can be a, a carrier. A reservoir is the term for these different diseases. But yes, um, this also goes to my huge adage: don't feed animals. They don't need your help. If anything, it defeats the purpose of them being wild. Um, because if something goes wrong and say uh, this actually did happen to a lady um, in Seattle, uh, I got the call. She had gotten bit by a female raccoon because she's been feeding these raccoons for years. And what ended up happening, she accidentally got between the female and her pups when she was feeding them with the, the dog bowl and it bit her leg. She then calls me and says, well, I just got bit, but I don't want the animal taken away. I'm like, ma'am. The animal has to be caught and tested for rabies. And I told her what was involved with that. And she basically hung up on me, to which I say, I, I'm sorry. I wish you the best of luck in what you're dealing with. But that is, 
That is science. Science doesn't care. So yes, I, <laughs> the guy who's feeding that those twenty-something raccoons. I don't remember. I don't know where he's from. Um, I want to say the Northeast, um, New England area. I think is where he's based out of. I'd have, I'll have to do more digging on that. But yeah, he's putting himself in a lot of risk. Because if he was too slow or if he tried pulling food away from one of those raccoons, they'll take his finger. They will absolutely, absolutely take his finger, a part of his foot, whatever they want. They don't care. They just know you're a vector for food or a, 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 a supplier of food, and that's about it. So, But yeah, no, guys, bring up these subjects. I love, I love like touching base on these kind of things. Um, but yeah, I'll be the first to say, don't if you have pets and you feed them outside, stop feeding outside. This goes for cats, dogs, any kind of pet you have. Uh, if you are feeding them and they are strictly an outdoor pet, do set feeding times. Don't leave the food out all the time. One, that's unhealthy for the pet. Two, that just invites other problems altogether. Not just raccoons, possums, rats, mice, birds. They all will come and feed at outside feeders. Um, with bird feeders, if you must have them, if you absolutely must have them and you absolutely can't live without your bird feeder, put it as far away from your house as possible. You want to put it at your far edge of your property. Yeah, I know, that's going to ruin the view for the birds. I don't care. The whole point is to try to keep you and your home safe. That's all I care about. I care about science, I care about education, and keeping people safe. That's really what it all is. Yeah, um, I have had plenty of rat projects from people that have bird feeders that just let it go quite literally they just do not care about their bird feeder they keep it filled and they're like wow it's empty every day yeah it's because you have a raccoon or a rat or a squirrel coming by and emptying your bird feeder oh i get so tired of that if you must have a type of bird feeder get a suet brick suet bricks are much harder for animals to pilfer as well as um, you can get some other species of birds that aren't as they don't become as reliant on humans as necessary. I don't like feeders in general, but if you must have it, it needs to be as far away from your structure as possible because when they eat, they drop stuff. They don't eat everything that's there. They will continue to pick through the suet or uh, like the multi-feed seed, uh, the seed bags. They have like the, the mixed seed. Don't do that. Do one type of seed because what happens is birds pick through it and they throw it. And then the rats, the raccoons, the possums, the, the mice, they all find what falls on the ground. And that's how you get broken bird feeders. Now, I have used bird feeders as a technique to try to get raccoons to come in so I can remove them. Because I had a house, similar situation. They had a bird feeder. The raccoons kept coming to the bird feeder. And their dog came out one night and got hit by three or four raccoons. It was a female with almost fully grown. Thanks. Uh, it was a female with almost fully grown juveniles that ended up literally dogpiling onto this dog. Um, the dog barely made it. It had to get major surgery in order to survive the attack. So you can not, you wouldn't be surprised to know that these folks were very vindictive about getting these raccoons gone, which I was there to help with that service. So, but yeah, guys, I try. I'm gonna try my hardest not to talk about like. Um, the death, anything, if an animal needs to be dispatched, I'm just going to mention that it is uh, dispatched or euthanized. I'm not going to talk about my practices or anything like that. I don't want to, I don't want to be diving into that kind of thing. So we'll, we'll, we'll get a feel for how this all works out. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll see how this all work, works out in the end. So we're just about hitting an hour. My throat can already feel it. Um, but yeah, uh, Feeding, just don't do it. If you don't have to, don't do it. Eviction versus exclusion talk would be good. Okay, I can, I can definitely make that a, um, I can definitely make that a subject. Yeah, guys, just hit me up with different thoughts, ideas. Send me messages through uh, Twitch here, um, just because that's easier for me to uh, to separate the different information flow. Because I'm on I'm on Discords, I'm on Facebook, I'm on a whole bunch of different platforms. So if I can keep an information flow coming into one specific point, I absolutely can do that. Um, I would, and I mean, who knows? Maybe I'll be lucky enough to get people to come visit me in my office. 
you'll maybe get to see some of my coworkers. We'll talk about different things, uh, different encounters that we've had or different experiences, and we'll see what we can figure out from there. Like I say, this is a very, I'm trying to be very fluid about a lot of this. So again, thank you guys for coming in. I really appreciate you hanging out with me for the uh, past hour and um, I'll be doing this again. So next stream will be Tuesday, um, 6 p.m. West Coast time. Um, I'm going to try to keep every, I'm going to try to keep to a regular schedule. I will have to reactivate my old Twitter to see if uh, I can get... If something needs to happen up there, like if I need to say there won't be a stream or something for a day, I'll see if I can throw something on Twitter or Facebook. Um, but yeah, guys, thank you so much for hanging. I will, uh, those of you that see me on different platforms and different servers, I'll see you then. But other than that, you guys have yourself a good night.